This is a viral math problem that has stumped many people online, and while the majority of people who can solve it solve it with geometry, I'm going to show you how you can use algebra to solve it and compare the two methods of finding a solution to see whether the algebraic or geometric solution is better. Pause the video if you want to give it a shot and once you get an answer, feel free to post it in the comments. But other than that, let's get into it. I'm going to start with the algebraic solution because that's probably what you clicked on this video for. But in order to get to that solution, we need to make some key observations about this diagram. The first two observations are that the relative sizes of the regions are accurate, but they're not to scale. To illustrate, let's take this top left piece and compare it to the bottom left one. It's clear that it's smaller than the bottom left one, but the numbers don't quite match up, because if they did, the top left piece would only be around one fourth the size of the bottom left piece. So, while we can draw conclusions like our unknown area is larger than the orange area, we can't really pinpoint how much larger it is based off a of visual. The next two observations are pretty obvious, but they play an important role in finding our final answer. Looking at the numbers of the areas that are given to us, we can see that the largest area is 132, and that the sum of all three of our known areas equals 192. Now, I'm going to reveal why these numbers are so important to our solution soon, but before I get there, try to see if you can figure it out on your own in the comments. On to our last observation. Because of these congruent lines, we can see that each side of our shape has the same length, which means we can conclusively call this a square. And again, I know that might have seemed obvious from the start, but with geometry puzzles like these, you've got to be extra thorough when making statements about a problem because the way something looks doesn't always translate to reality. But now with our observations out of the way, we can move on to solving for the area algebraically. If you wrote in the comments that the two numbers we found in our observations create a lower and upper bound for our unknown area, then congratulations because you were correct. Here's how it works. Because the sizes of our areas are relatively accurate, we can see two things. First, our unknown area is larger than the orange area. And second, our unknown area is smaller than all the other areas combined. Translating that into numbers, we can say that our unknown area has to be a number greater than 132 and less than the sum of all the other areas, which we found to be 192. Next, because we confirm this is a square, we can express the total area as the square of one of its side lengths. Let's call that side length s and the area s squared. And now that we have this expression for the area, we can set it equal to the sum of all of our regions. We can then simplify this to 192 plus the unknown area, which we can call x. And really quick, I'm going to subtract over the 192 since what we're trying to solve for is the x term. Then from here, we can use one of the most reliable mathematical tools for solving simple equations like this. Guess and check. But this isn't a standard guess and check, because by using the upper and lower bounds for our unknown area we found earlier, we can turn this into an educated guess and check. Here's how we'll do it. To start, we know that the total area must be greater than 192 because that's the sum of these three smaller areas. So that means s can only be numbers that are greater than 192 when you square them, which works out to s needing to be a number greater than 13. We then plug in a valid value for s, square it, and then subtract 192 from it. If the result is less than or equal to 132, we know that it can't be our area because it must be larger than the orange area. But if the result is greater than 192, we can also say with certainty that it's not our area because it has to be less than the sum of the other three areas. And so, with those constraints in mind, here are the perfect squares for the values of s between 14 and 20. And here's what they become when we subtract 119 from them. If you notice, there's only one result that is both less than 192 and greater than 132. And what that means is that the missing area of our square is 169. However, even though we found the correct area, there's a major problem with this algebraic method. To show you what that flaw is, let's look at a different version of our problem. This is what the square initially looked like when I first started to create this problem. There's not too much of a difference. The sum of all three areas is still 192, but now, instead of the largest area being 132, it's now 125. Now I know this doesn't seem like it would change a lot, but it completely destroys our ability to answer the question algebraically. Here's why. Since the largest known area is now 125, our lower bound for x becomes 125 instead of 132. And now, if we do what we did before and try to eliminate the potential areas based off the lower and upper bounds, we see that there's now two areas that could be valid. And because the algebraic method doesn't give us a way to tell which one of these two areas it could be, we can't give an accurate answer in these set of circumstances. And one more thing, as a little bit of a thought experiment for the algebraic method, I want to ask these questions. If the sides of the square weren't a whole number, can the algebraic solution still work? And if it does, is it still as effective as before? 
These are important questions to keep in mind when we compare the two methods later in this video. But on to the geometric solution. Instead of our shape needing to meet a fairly specific set of criteria, this method lets us find the missing area for any version of this problem. This is how it works. As we saw before, all of these segments have the same length, which means these lines inside the square intersect the sides at their midpoints. As a result, we can use this symmetry to our advantage by drawing lines from the corners of the square to the point where the lines connect. And what this creates is four sets of triangles that have identical areas because they have the same base and the same height. Now, if you're like me when I first saw this solution, you might be skeptical that this actually creates triangles with identical areas. So to really convey why drawing these diagonal lines from the corners of the square to our interior point has this effect, let's focus on the bottom two triangles. Like we stated before, in order for these to have identical areas, they need to have the same base and height. Since these lines are congruent, it's fairly easy to see that these triangles have the same base. Their heights, however, are a bit harder to show. The height of a triangle is the length of the line perpendicular to its base that goes from the base to the topmost point of the triangle. Since both triangles share the same base and topmost point, their heights must be equal. But to visualize this, let's draw a horizontal line through this point. If we draw a vertical line that spans the distance between the base and this new horizontal line, we can construct a nice visual that shows how both triangles share the same height. So now that we know why drawing those diagonal lines works, let's get back to solving the rest of our problem. For clarity, let's label the different sets of triangles with the letters A through D. Now, if you notice, the triangles A, B, C, and D show up twice along the opposite diagonals of the square, which is very useful because we can set up this equality that helps us find our missing area. Adding up the bottom left and top right triangles, we see that the area of our first set of ABCD triangles equals 180.5, which means the left side of our equality becomes this. Then, we take this area of 11.5 and substitute our second C and B areas with it. And since the remaining A plus D area equals X, this gives us the final equality that lets us solve for our missing area, which we know from the algebraic method equals 169. And this is the power of the geometric method. It doesn't need a set of criteria in order to provide a solution. But which one do you prefer? The algebraic method needs the right conditions to work, but it's a lot easier to remember, and when it does work, the computation is faster than the geometric way. However, even though the geometric method is a bit harder, it can always produce a solution because it's not reliant on specific criteria. If you want my personal opinion, I'd have to go with the geometric solution for two main reasons. One, you can't really beat its reliability. Even if the algebraic method is faster in some cases, the ability of the geometric method to always give an answer outweighs that speed. And two, geometry is actually one of my weaker areas of math, and if I want to get better at it, I'll have to practice it. Feel free to share your answer in the comments too, and if you want to solve another viral problem, watch this video next. Thank you for watching.